Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord, both now and forevermore. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Good evening. Good evening. I pray that everyone had a wonderful and safe holiday on yesterday, in spite of the massive shooting that's taken place in Highland Park, Illinois. And in spite of the different events that have taken place around our city, which caused tragedies and people's lives to be taken, yet God is still in control of all things. And we still want to give him praise, even in the midst of persecution, trials, and tests, and storms in our lives. He's still in control of every situation. He calls all things to work together for the good. So we're going to go ahead and to our, our, our lesson this evening, but I'm opening up in a word of prayer. And I pray this message will encourage someone today and help you overcome the spirit of the offense and help you begin to see yourself through the eyes of Christ, victorious the way God has designed for you to be a winner in the kingdom of God. So, Lord God, this evening I come before your awesome presence saying thank you, Lord God, for another blessed day that you have created. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, oh God, to will and do according to your good pleasure. Thank you, Lord God, for saving us and delivering us from the domain of darkness, translating to the kingdom of your dear Son. Lord, we worship you. We magnify your great name. For truly you are awesome and you are mighty, God. There is no one like you in all the earth. Lord God, I pray tonight, Father, that you give us clarity and understanding from the Word of God that will help us to grow in grace and the knowledge of who you are, even overcome the spirit of offense, O oh God, that may be lost in someone's heart tonight, O oh God. Unforgiveness, bitterness, resentfulness, O oh God. Help them to find their freedom by letting go and letting God have his way in their lives. Cleanse our minds and our hearts, O oh God. Forgive for our sins, knowingly and unknowingly. Come into our heart to God tonight, God, and wash us in the blood of now. And I thank you for giving us another chance to worship your majesty, your holy name, O oh God. For truly you're worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down the same, your name is worthy to be praised. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Deacon Cannon. God bless you. Amen. Amen. I want to start out tonight by reading... Uh, Today's devotion from the book, More of You, God. More of You, God. It says, I'm praising God Almighty, El Shaddai, for you reign, Lord. As I look around, today I can see your power, your majesty. Many, many years ago, El Shaddai was the name you first used to identify yourself to Abraham. You are still the same God today. Who, pass, who, who possess overwhelming strength. You are still the same God today who possess overwhelming strength. No one can stop you, move you, or change you. El Shaddai, you are the God of all mountains. You declared your promises to Abraham. I live by every promise in your word as I've been adopted into the royal family. As I walk each day and stand on your word, or better yet, when I work the, your word to submit to it, your word actually manifests in my life. When I believe for healing, I receive it. When I believe for prosperity, I get it. When I believe for your favor, I get it. I'm walking in my victory daily with my almighty God. I lift up holy hands unto you, I'm living with and enjoying more of you, God. Amen, amen. I just love the devotions in this book, More of You, God, by uh, Dor Dorothy Dotson. I tell you, it's a mighty, mighty, wonderful book that our sister has written for us, for our learning, for our guidance throughout the day. And I tell you, when you allow the Spirit of God to minister to your heart, this book becomes liberating. It becomes liberating in our spirits. It sets you free by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all you gotta do is just receive the revelation. There's a lot of reference scriptures in this in these uh, devotionals. Every day is a two-year devotional. And I tell you, it is a wonderful book to add to your library. Amen. God bless you, uh, Doretha Webster. God bless you. Thank you all for joining tonight. 
Tonight we're going to engage in chapter one of the book, The Bait of Satan. The Bait of Satan. We're going to engage in that book. And I tell you, this is a very liberating book. When you get this book, The Bait of Satan, Living Free from the Deadly Traps of Offense, this book will begin to cause you to examine your heart to see what's in your heart that's not right. If there's something on the inside that's hindering you from your spiritual growth, Sometimes you got, got to go back to the source. There's a root cause and there's an effect. And you have to figure out what is the root cause in my life that caused me to live a life of offense or even a life of resentment, a life of bitterness, a life of always being angry, always being hateful towards people, always lashing out at other people because I'm not happy. You have to go and dig within the root of your heart to find out where did it all begin. Some people, when they examine their hearts, they find out offenses began as a child from something that the mother or the father instilled in you that made you very resentful growing up or some abuse you may have gone through as a child and you kept it locked into the treasure chest of your heart and God is trying to set you free but you find yourself fighting a force that you can't overpower because it's been locked in your mentality and God wants us to let our minds go and get the mind of Christ you hear what I just said let our minds go <clears throat> and get the mind of Christ so Chapter one, we talked about the introduction, we talked about the prefix of the book, what the book is all about. We talked about the introduction, how the book is going to be, be begin to liberate many people, open up your heart to set you free from bondage of offense, the bondage of sin, strongholds, imprisonment in your mind. So tonight we want to talk about our response to an offense determines our future. Our response to an offense determines our future. That's something to think about. Because many choices we make throughout life either works for you or works against you. Some choices that we make enhance the spiritual growth. Some cause us to decline in our spiritual growth. <clears throat> So the choices that we make, God told Joshua in the book of Joshua, I believe in the chapter, chapter six, he said, I set before you life and death, choose life and live that you and your descendants may live. Why? Because what choice you determine to follow after is either going to build you or destroy you. So it's up to you to make a decision within your heart. What is my determination of how I'm going to have the outcome of life? I don't know why this is buffering again. It's starting to buffer tonight, but we're just going to pray that God give us clarity in the airways. So it's ignore the glitch. It does play normal when you go back on YouTube and watch it later on. Cause I always put these lessons on YouTube each week. As a matter of fact, when you go to my YouTube channel, subscribe to it. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. You'll find all the lessons that we've been talking about on the Pastor Charles Emery. You see my picture on there. And um, I have a shield in the background of my picture. That, that's how you know it's me. And all my lessons are on YouTube. You can follow each week the lessons and go back and review them again if you choose. And also share these lessons each week with somebody else. Because these are not just for you, but it's also a tool that God has given me to help the body of Christ learn about their identity in Christ, learn about the relationship in Christ, and grow in Christ. Amen? Chapter 1. Me offended. Me offended. Go to Luke, St. Luke chapter 17. St. Luke chapter 17, beginning verse 1. I'm going to read this in the King James and I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. Verse 1, Then he said unto his disciples, Who is he? Jesus. 
it is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. And in the NIV, New, the in, New International Version, New International Version, Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. But woe to anyone whom they come. So in other words, there is no way to get around offenses in life. People are going to offend you. The news media are going to offend you. People on your job are going to offend you. You go in a grocery store, you're going to be offended. Walking down the street, you may be offended. Why? Because an offense is a violation. It's something that someone either do to you to make you uncomfortable, to hurt you, or something you do to somebody else to inflict an offense upon them to make them feel uncomfortable. Even make them belittle themselves and feel inadequate or unworthy. Many times we said things we shouldn't have said and we hurt other people's feelings because we weren't mindful of the words allowed to come out of our mouth. Someone may have stepped on your toe or um, mistakenly done something you didn't mean to hurt you <coughs> and it hurt and it offended you. You may have been in a restaurant, got offended by, by the staff, the way you were treated. So if this is something that comes to our lives that makes you uncomfortable. So when you get offended, we got to have the attitude of Christ every day of our life and not the attitude of the enemy. The attitude of the enemy is to retaliate, to respond and reciprocate to an individual the way they come to you and respond back to them the same way they came to me. So you have to allow the attitude of Christ to be inside of you to bring discipline and self-order in the spirit of the living God. Allow the Holy Spirit to put a bit in your mouth and a bridle on your tongue that you only speak what God commands you to speak by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. It says, as I travel across the United States ministry, I've been able to observe one of the enemy's most deadly and deceptive traps. It imprisons countless Christians, severs relationships, and widens the existing breach between us. It is a trap of offense. It is the trap of offense. See, offense can be very dangerous. Offense can put you in a, in a place where you find yourself being stuck in darkness and can't get out of it. And it is one of the greatest tools the enemy uses or weapons he uses against a believer to make you get to the place where you start walking in unbelief. Many are unable to function properly in their calling because of the wounds and the hurts that offenses have caused in their lives. People have been so offended when they go out and commit suicide. People get so offended they'll go out and kill somebody else. L you look in the news, we see these mass shootings it's been happening for the last few months. All because somebody was offended. Somebody was hurt. Somebody might have went through abuse. Whatever it is that caused you to become offended, you have to get to yourself where the word tells you to go and reconcile. It is very important and it's vital to your Christian health to learn how to reconcile when people mistreat you. I found a scripture earlier in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through, seven, through um, 17. And it says, if your brother, and this is it's in the English Standard Version, the English Standard Version, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. We're talking about offense. So if you go to church and someone mistreats you in the church and you don't say anything about it but harbor it in your heart, you fester that thing in your heart and then before you know it, you're premeditating how I'm going to get even. So the word says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his faults. Between you and him 
alone. If I hurt you or I said something to you you didn't like, don't go tell everybody else about it. Come to the source. If I'm the one that caused an offense in your life, you need to have the adult mentality by the Holy Spirit to come to me one-to-one, -one, face to face, and tell me what I've done to you to hurt you. And I, being a man of God, have to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit that when someone comes to me and say, hey, you offended me. Let's talk about it. Let's reason together. What did I do to, to hurt you? <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know what's going on in my throat. Devil's a lie. So we sit down and we talk about it and we reconcile. So we won't have the same problem again. But instead, we got folk in the church that tell bears. Someone hurt them. The pastor may have preached the message that hurt them and thought he was dipping in their business because God revealed something about them in the message. That happened to me before. Preaching a message. Someone got offended because of something in the message was about their relationship, what was going on. I had no idea, no clue. And they got mad at me and left the church. And when God revealed to me the reason why he left the church, I went to the individual and began to explain to them that under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, God would give me revelation to speak things that I don't even know what's going on in your life, but it relates to your life, circumstance. And we're able to reconcile. We have to have the attitude of Christ with a willingness if someone offends you, to go and make things right. He said, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So you go to your brother, you have a fault against, they have a fault against you, and you talk to them, and he said, if they listen to you, you gain your brother, or you redeem them. But if he does not listen, Take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So what this scripture is saying Tax collectors and Gentiles were considered outcasts. They were considered dogs. So in other words, don't associate with them. If they can't be won over through repentance, leave them alone. But you also got to pray for their soul that they be saved. In Luke chapter 17, verse 3 and 4, Luke chapter 17, verse 3 and 4, in the English Standard Version, we read this last week in the King James. And it says, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times, saying, I repent, you must forgive him. We talked about this last week, that you cannot go on holding on a, on to a grudge because someone done something or said something you didn't like. You got to have the attitude of Christ to make reconciliation, restore the relationship, ask for forgiveness, rebuke him, or let him rebuke you. That means to correct, to chastise, and love. Not to tear down, not to be a tailbearer, not to slander, not to persecute, but to forgive. And if you don't forgive, your heavenly father will not forgive you your trespasses. Then it goes on, so they are handicapped and hindered from fulfilling their full potential. So offenses will entrap you 
But not only does it entrap you, it hinders your spiritual growth. And it hinders you from walking in the calling and the purpose God has called you out of darkness to fulfill for the kingdom of God. It will keep you from walking in the light of the word of God and the truth of God's righteousness. It will keep you in a rebellious state of mind, opposing and resisting God. This calls, let me go up a little further. It says, more often, it is a fellow believer who has hurt them. This caused the offense to feel like a betrayal. You know what? David says in one of the Psalms, when he was offended, he said, you know what? If it was a brother who offended me, no, he said it was an enemy who offended me, I, I, I could have received that. I could have dealt with that. But he said it was one of my own acquaintance one who ate bread with me, one who drank from the same cup with me, who has lifted his heel against me. In other words, offended me. And God is saying tonight, if you know that you are the one that caused an offense in somebody else's life, you need to repent to that brother and before God. Because if you don't repent, you cause yourself to be a rebellion and reproach unto God. And God says that judgment will begin at the house of God. So not only God is going to bring judgment, but you are cutting yourself off from the benefits and the promises God has for your life. In Psalm 55, verse 12 to 14, David laments. That means weeps. He laments. Said, for it's not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hate me, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from it. But it was you, a man of my equal, my companion, and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together, and we walked to the house of God in the throng. This is the script I'm referring to. We walk to the house of God together. They are those who we sit with and sing alongside. Or perhaps it is the one who is delivering the sermon. We spend holidays, attend social functions, share offices with them, or perhaps it is even closer. We grew up with them. We confided in them. We even sleep next to them. The closer the relationship, the more severe the offense. If it's an enemy who hurts me, I can deal with it. I can get over it. But somebody who's in relationship with me, who spent many years with me, who knows my ends and my out, knows my secrets. It's the very one who turned against me. So David says, even went to the house of God with me. If you know somebody that you are in relationship with, who has become an offense to you, guess what? They have become an offense to God. Because you as a child of God, who are practicing righteousness, practicing uprightness before God, practicing living in the Holy Spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. If you are the one who is a child of God, born again, and filled with the Holy Spirit, if someone offends you, they're offending God. Because it's the God in you that they are offending. It's not your flesh that's being offended. It's the spirit in you that's being offended. And when you know that you have a relationship with God, a genuine Holy Ghost relationship with God, the spirit inside of you becomes offended when someone does something against the righteousness of God. The Bible says, for all have sinned, 
and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, became an offense to God. By you rebelling, living a sinful life, continually walking in darkness, straddling the fence, call yourself a child of God, you're still doing the things of the flesh to glorify your flesh and not God. God says you become an offense to him. So I must warn you tonight that you need to change your mindset. Because if your mind is sinning against God, your actions become a reproach against God. Because you're rebelling against the truth of the gospel. So how can we two walk together so we be in agreement? So if I can't agree with you to walk in righteousness, I need to separate myself from you. Because it said, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. What has light with darkness? What has righteousness with, with a Belial or the devil? You cannot mingle with unsaved folk and call yourself a child of God unless you win them over to Christ. If you're not going to win them to Christ, then you allow yourself to be reproached to God. An attorney will tell you the most vicious cases are in the divorce courts. The American media constantly reports murders in homes by desperate family members. The home meant to be a shelter of protection, provision, and growth where we learn to give and receive love is often the very root of our pain. The house that we grew up in, the relationships that we're in, it's supposed to be a relationship or a home that's based on the foundation of Jesus Christ, built on love, built on compassion, built on gentleness, built on long suffering, meekness, gentleness, tempers, forbearance, all these different things stem from Jesus Christ, the foundation of our house supposed to be on Christ. And if anything else is built on your foundation that's not enhancing Christ in your house, you, are, you have a house that's built on sand. So when the storms of life comes, the winds blow of society, your house begins to crumble. Why? Relationship fall apart because we became, lack of what it say, incompatible. So marriages fall apart because we become incompatible. The love that wants you to drag us to one another has been broken, been breached by the enemy. So now the house is divided. The enemy knows what strategy to use to divide your house. He knows who to sin in your pathway to entice you to sin against God. He knows who to attract you to get you to a place to commit adultery and fornication. He knows what buttons to push in your life to make you become a murderer, even a thief, a prostitute, a liar, a whoremonger. He knows exactly what to push in your life, to draw you away from your foundation. History shows that the bloodiest wars are civil, brother against brother, sons against father, father against son. Not only that, it's the, 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 the uh, boyfriends killing the girlfriend children because of jealousy, because I don't want responsibility. I, I did everything I, I did to produce these children. So because now my guilt and condemnation eat me up, I don't want the responsibility of taking care of no child. So what I do, I kill them. I abuse them. I hurt them. I scorch them. I destroy their mentality. Belittle them. And so many times, that's what the enemy uses as an offense against you and your house. The possibility for offense are as endless as a list of relationships, no matter how complex or simple. The truth remains, only those you care about can hurt you. You expect more from them 
after all you've given them more of yourself to them. The higher the expectation, the higher the fall. The higher the expectation, the higher the fall. And that is a true statement. Because the more I depend on someone that's close to me, and we're not building each other up and encouraging one another, edifying one another, it gives the enemy the right to enter in and interfere. And when he comes in to interfere in your relationship, he calls a wedge a separation. Now I hate myself or I hate the other person or I hate you or you hate me because I allowed a breach to enter into my relationship through an offense. The spouse may have said something to help make you better and you didn't like it, so now I'm mad at her. Or she's, he's mad at her. Why? Because I was offended. And when I got offended, I allowed that offense to go into my mindset, which caused my mindset to open up the avenue for the enemy to feed me with all negativity and all types of garbage to make me begin to lash out against my spouse. Been there, done that. Being young, dumb, foolish, not listening to the Spirit of God, cause a relationship to fall. And I'm telling you that it'll happen to you if you're not careful, if you're not praying together, you're not building each other up, you're not standing the Word of God, you're not consecrating together. You leave yourself open game for the enemy's hunting game. You leave yourself open game for the enemy hunting game. And he's going to come in and begin to entrap you and bait you to lure you out of your relationship with God. If I can destroy your physical relationship, I can destroy your, spirit, your spiritual relationship. That's what he's looking for. And a way to assassinate. We have to pay attention. We have to pay attention. The enemy is so crafty and so cunning. You read the Old Testament, you find many accounts where the enemy came in and brought deception and destruction. Men and women today look out for themselves to neglect and hurt those around them. Men and women today look out for themselves to neglect and hurt those around them. Look in the news. Look in our churches. Look in our communities. What we find? Selfishness. We find people hurting people because I'm hurt. And because I'm hurt, I go and hurt many other people. And that is the tactic of the enemy to destroy God's people. If I can turn them against each other, cause them to fight each other, the church will never be unified. Guess what? The enemy's doing his job. Are you doing yours? Ask yourself this question tonight. You got any questions or comments right now? I want you to type your question or your comment. Because this, this is so good. If the enemy is doing his job, what are you doing with your life? Are you doing everything God instructs you to do to build your spiritual life, to build your foundation, to build the calling on your life? Or are you doing just what the enemy wants you to do to keep on living a life that's separated and alienated from God? The more you walk in darkness, the more the light is being smothered out of you. The more you walk in darkness, that zeal, that passion, that fire that had you when you first came to Christ is slowly getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until it's just a little spark. Why? Because I gave the enemy ammunition to assassinate me. That's why we have to be prayed up. We have to be careful, my brother, my sister. You got to be careful. The enemy knows what he's doing to stop you. Ignore the glitches. It's still glitching. Ignore the glitches tonight. The enemy knows if I can put some blinders on your eyes, 
to turn you from the gospel truth, I can bait you. I can set the things that you love to, to please your flesh with before your eyes and that all you see is that and not God. If I can distract you from seeing God being revealed in your heart, I can cause you to be blinded from the truth of God's word. You know what? I was praying earlier and God spoke to me. He said many of his children have been baited by the enemy into a trap of unbelief. The reason why so many Christians are sick and broken down because of their confession. The enemy afflicts you. He allows stuff that fester in your body. Oh, you even do it yourself because the stuff you eat, the stuff you devour, the stuff you put in your body, you know, ain't no good for you. It, it causes you to have all types of issues, health problems. God says, because you're not praying and paying attention to what you're consuming. The same with this in the spirit realm. If I consume all the junk of the world that it offers to me, I'm allowing myself to become spiritually sick. When I get spiritually sick, guess what follows? My natural man becomes sick. Because the natural man receives not the things of the spirit, nor can he know them because the spiritual desire. So the more I pray and seek God's face, they connect it to the spirit. God says the Holy Spirit begin to warn you, to guard you, to protect you, to guide you, to direct you, to get things that are going to help build your health, not destroy it. So we neglect the spirit and we listen to the flesh. So when I get sick and I go to the doctor, they say, oh, you got this disease or you got this problem, you got this issue, but it can be fixed. And then you get something that can't be fixed because you made the wrong choice. Like we started on the beginning of our lesson tonight. Choices. What choice are you choosing? Are you choosing to be the change you want to see in your life? Are you choosing to destroy yourself by your words? Jesus told disciples so you will be snared by your own words. We have to be careful what I allow to come out of my mouth, what I allow to go into my ear gate. My ear gate has a great factor, is a great factor to determine the outcome of my life. I'm going to tell you why. The word tells us Romans, Romans 8, I think 8, 8 uh, 17. In fact, I'm going to go there. I'm going to go there. I want to be accurate tonight. I want to be accurate on this. This is really good. This is really good. Let's see. Okay. Romans, that ain't it. No, 10. Romans chapter 10. Correction. My apologies. Romans chapter 10. And it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, it says, for with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made, right? Unto salvation. So if it says that your confession is lined up with receiving salvation, guess what the opposite? Your confession lined up with the flesh is to your demise. Romans chapter 10, verse 8. Romans chapter 10, verse 8. It says, what saith it? The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So the word that we preach brings salvation it brings deliverance. It brings wholeness to my body and my mind and my spirit. Guess what the opposite is? The more I confess the negative things the enemy feeds me, go into my ear gate, it goes into my heart. It comes out of my mouth. So if I feed all this stuff, Jesus says like this, not what goes in you that defiles you, but what comes out of you defiles you. So if I'm constantly feeding myself with garbage, garbage in, garbage out, right? Garbage in, garbage out. 
So the more garbage I put in my ear gate, goes to my mindset, gets to my heart, comes out my mouth. So the more I allow this stuff to fester, guess what garbage does? Garbage decays. Garbage begin to mold. Garbage begin to stink. And God told Jonah, when he told him to go preach to Nineveh, he said, tell them that sin has come before me as a stinking odor. It was foul, detestable. God says tonight, are you devouring garbage in your heart tonight? Are you feeding on the word of God? Are you allowing the word of God to build you, to strengthen you, to nurture you, to mature you, to make you an adult in the kingdom of God? Or are you still a baby sucking on the bottle, desiring the milk of the milk of the word? Being in an age you should have matured by now, you're still a baby. God says tonight, make up your mind. Make your decision. What life are you going to live? Are you going to live for Christ? Or are you going to continue to feed on the things of the world? Become an offense to God. This should not be, this should not surprise us. The Bible is very clear that in last days, men will be lovers of themselves. Second Timothy chapter three, verse two. We expect this in unbelievers, but Paul was not referring to those outside the church. He was talking about those within it. Men becoming lovers of themselves in the last days with seeing it so prevalent in the news media, on social media, all around the world. We're finding something that identifies about somebody becoming a lover of themselves. But Paul was not talking about the sinner man because the sinner man is doing what they're supposed to do. Keep on sinning. He's talking about those who call themselves born-again believers, filled with the Holy Spirit, who are still walking according to the dictates of the flesh. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill or accomplish the desires of the flesh. But he said they will become lovers of themselves. He was talking about those within the church. Many are wounded, hurt, and bitter. They are offended, but they do not realize that they have fallen into Satan's trap. The reason why you find so many church folk bitter, miserable, got an angry spirit all the time, a mean demeanor all the time in the church because somewhere down the road in their life, they're allowing the fence to get in their heart. And their offense caused to become negative and foul and detestable in the eyes of God. But one thing about God, hallelujah to the Lamb of God, He loves us to enough to not leave us in the state of mind because of grace. Where grace abounds, it overpowers sin. So where sin abounds, grace much more abounds, right? So if the grace of God is God's protection, is God's covering, God's ability to bring you out of circumstances, situations, then why not trust in God? Why are we allowing ourselves to be distracted by the things of the world? God says, if you love me, you're going to love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, your entire being is going to love God. It's very important, my brother and my sister tonight, to allow the love of God to overpower an offense in your heart. If you're on here tonight, you got some type of resentment, some type of unforgiveness in your heart towards anybody, even cause you to become bitter, even sick, repent before God and before the individual and allow the Holy Spirit to restore you and the individual back into right relationship with each other and right with God. It is our fault. Is it our fault 
Jesus made it very clear that it's, that it's impossible to live in this world and not have the opportunity to become offended. It is very impossible to live in this world and not become offended. But how you respond to it is the key. If someone offends you, is your response going to be to react according to the leadership of your mind of the flesh or to be proactive, begin to pray inwardly, Holy Spirit, how shall I respond to this? And the Holy Spirit, let him lead you to say the right things to fix the situation. Yet most believers are shocked, bewildered, and even amazed when it happened. We believe we are the only ones who have been wronged. This response leaves us vulnerable to a root of bitterness. If you have that attitude where you always feel, why everybody's always picking on me? I remember the song, Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown. Why everybody always picking on me? If you have that kind of attitude where you feel like somebody always picking on you, somebody always saying something to hurt you, somebody always doing something to hurt you, you need to change your mindset because it's impossible to make it into the kingdom of God with that kind of attitude. And it will lead you to a root of bitterness. Therefore, we must be prepared and armed for offenses. You know what I love about the scripture? Everything that entails our lives have been written in the book. Everything according to the situation we encounter has been written in the book. You won't know it until you take it off your shelf that's from collecting dust, open it up, and read it. Read the Proverbs. Read the Psalms. If you don't know what to read in the Bible, start reading Psalms and Proverbs. Because Psalms talks about David's complaints and how God fixes situations. Proverbs is a book of wisdom. Gives you instruction. Gives you counsel. Gives you guidance. And the word, I guarantee, will begin to change your attitude and give you a better outcome our outlook and outcome in life. Because the more I put the word inside of me, the word begins to produce fruit of righteousness that comes out of me. So anything I do to promote God's kingdom, God gets the glory. God gets the glory. So we have to arm ourselves as Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. And finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Then it says, put on the full armor of God that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. So you got to arm yourself. When you get up in the morning, you know how you can arm yourself in the morning you wake up? Father, I thank you for another day for waking me up. I thank you for the breath of life. I thank you for protecting me all night long. I thank you to be the leader of my day. I thank you, Lord God, you're going to guide me to be your vessel of righteousness of the day to help somebody become free. Lord, close me in the full armor. So I take the scriptures, begin to read the scriptures, meditate on the scripture to guard my heart with the full armor of God. And guess what? Because our response determines our future. That when I arm myself, my response, according to the word of God, determines the outcome of my future. We're going to stop right here. We're going to pick it up next week with the deceptive trap. I pray that something tonight has encouraged you to get in your word, to study the word, get the word inside of you, Speak that word to yourself. If you have to look yourself in the mirror because you're dealing with a stronghold, you're dealing with a bad habit, you have an addiction that seems to be hard to break, look yourself in the mirror. The Bible talks about James chapter 1, verse 17, I believe it is. He talks about looking in the looking glass of the word. And, and he said, and then you turn and walk away, forgetting what manner of man you are. We have to look in the word of God, see ourselves by looking in the mirror. I take the word of God, look at myself in the mirror, 
and say, flesh, today I put on the forearm of God to stand against the walls of the devil. I put on the breastplate of righteousness, put on the loin belt of truth, put on my shoes of peace, my loin belt, the helmet of salvation, all these different components it talks about in Ephesians. We put it on with a purpose of arming ourselves from the tactics of the enemy. If you don't put it on, how are you going to find yourself being defended when the enemy comes against you? If you don't put on your armor, guess what happens? It says, finally, my brother, take on the, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against, withstand and able, be able to withstand an evil day, and having done so, to stand all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loin belt girded about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shall the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith. Where would you say be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and the helmet of salvation protecting your mind and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which is your mouth. The sword of the spirit comes from your mouth. How you defend yourself determines what type of weapon you have. That's a sword. Either you have a sword of the spirit of God or the sword of the enemy and whatever you speak, either going to help somebody, heal somebody, deliver somebody, or destroy them. So I encourage you tonight, get in your word. Allow the word of God to manifest inside of you. And I guarantee that word begin to marinate in your heart, get, build your spiritual muscles, change your thought life, change your confession, change your attitude, your whole demeanor begins to change when the word is being revealed in your life because now you have Christ being revealed through you. That's what it's talking about. Letting Christ be that full armor that goes before you. And when you put on that full armor, you'll be able to stand secure in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ against every satanic attack that will come against you. So, Lord God, tonight, I thank you for this word. I pray this word have not fallen upon deaf ears, but the word will begin to marinate God, to produce fruit of righteousness in the hearts of those that heard this word tonight, to change our attitude, to change our lives from this day forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I want to ask you to do me a favor. I want you to sow a seed into the, to the ministry, the Bible class. Each week we do the Bible class. And it helps the ministry. We're in the process of building our church. We expanded. We're going to be expanding our church starting next year. And I want to encourage you to sow a seed. Also, I'm going to post on here tonight, as I did last week, uh, uh, the website for all the lessons that um, I've been teaching that you can uh, go back, follow these lessons again, share these lessons with somebody else. Allow the Spirit of God to minister to your heart. And I tell you the truth. The more you put that word before you every day, the word will change your life forever. Whatever seed you sow, it doesn't matter the amount. It can be a dollar. It can be 50 cents. It doesn't matter what it is. Whatever seed God put in your heart to sow, sow your seed. It doesn't just go to me. It goes to the ministry. Because everything that I do, I do to enhance the ministry. Each week with the Bible classes is for the enhancement of the ministry. And I tell you, I love teaching God's word. And if it's something I don't know, I'm going to study it till I find out what it is about. So I pray that you be compelled by the spirit of God tonight to sow a seed. The word says give, and it come back to you. Good measures, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. So when you sow a seed, expect God to sow back into your life. God will send an avenue of other people to bless you in many different ways. It's not always monetary. God can bless you with a ride. He can bless you with, with going to the store, giving someone a kind word. Doesn't matter what that seed is. Allow God to touch your heart, to be obedient, because that's what he's looking for, is obedience and sowing your seed. So I want you to pray this prayer with me tonight. 
Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive me, Lord, for my sins, knowingly and unknowingly. I thank you for giving me another chance. Now come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me, restoring me, and reviving me, even healing me. And I ask God right now that you fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Lord God, I thank you for your people tonight, oh God, every one of them, oh God, even those who sow a seed, those who desire to sow a seed, don't have it, God. I pray you bless them anyway, oh God, that you open the windows of heaven, put them out blessing, they don't have enough room to receive, and begin to restore them a hundredfold blessing plus. And I thank you for it, God, the heart of obedience to follow for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I, again, I want to thank you. If you got any questions, feel free to inbox me your questions. Feel free to call me if you have to call me. I don't mind because this is about building, kingdom building. The more we learn together, the more we grow together. How can they hear without a preacher? How can they hear without a preacher? And God has instructed me to be that preacher for this hour to teach his word unto you, his children, and many others who see this video later on to help change their life. So I encourage you, stay excited about Jesus. Don't allow the enemy to deceive and manipulate you out of your blessing and the promises God has for your life. Now may the grace of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest through the Bible with us, henceforth now and forevermore, until we meet again. God bless you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. May the Lord be gracious to you. And may the Lord bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Shalom. Next week. Same time, 6 o'clock p.m. The Lord said the same. We'll see you next week again. Have a good night. Amen. 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 Thank you, Cousin Jackie. God bless you. Thank you, uh, Sister Terry. God bless you. Amen. I pray this, this continue to grow. Grow each week. Let's continue to grow. So this is life-changing word God has given me. So you all have a great night. All right.